All right, here we are again. <laughs> um, so today we'll be doing chapter eight, which is, uh, let's see, let's go find it on Moodle. Oops, not there. All right, here we go. <clears throat> okay, so um, chapter eight is down here. Uh, the sample midterm, by the way, is is here. Uh, we posted it um, last week after Wednesday. So remember, this one is based on chapters three, four. Uh, sorry, three, five, six, and seven only. So that's where we are right now. As a matter of fact, we just finished seven the other day. So we're ready to roll on this. And so you can see that I've got a list of terms that we've learned. Okay. And actually, when you look at it, it looks quite like it's a very long list, isn't it? You can see we've covered a lot of material so far. Oh, by the way, don't forget about this little detail here. It says Bayes theorem here, but remember, we're not actually going to have that on the test. If I accidentally Put it in there for some reason. Um, you just you could just ignore it, but I don't think so. Um, some semesters we cover it, some semesters we don't. But with a short course like this one, um, it's one of those topics that's maybe not quite as important as some of the others, and it's also quite complicated. So um, I usually take it out when we have relatively short sessions. But um, if I accidentally put it into the uh, midterm, you know. I'll, I'll just not count it. Okay, I'll, I'll be careful. But if it slips in there, um, just remember, it does not count. You do not have to uh, do a Bayes theorem problem. Okay, the rest of these, though, um, these are all perfectly valid questions. And um, you should be ready for all of them. And then down here, we have some short fill in questions. Uh, these are a little different because all you have to do is fill in typically a few words or maybe a couple of sentences would take care of it. These are not actually problems as such, uh, but you, they still test your understanding of the concepts that we've been covering. Okay, so um, in, you know, you don't have to feel like you have to write an essay for each one. In many cases, a few, like I said, a few words up to a couple of sentences will probably take care of it. Um, Maybe in one or two cases, there you might need a number, but that's about it. Okay, then of course, we get to the problems, and they should all look very familiar to you. This is exactly what we've been doing. There's nothing new here. It's just that there's a lot of problems, that's all. Um, yeah, but this is what, oh my God, there's so many of them. So, um, wow. So that's going to take a while. That's why I think I'd like to start this tomorrow. It probably... I don't know if it'll take up the entire class tomorrow, but it might. So um, I'd like to start tomorrow. And um, it'll be a good opportunity to make sure you understand everything we've done up to this point. Uh, I'm still working on the uh, assignments, by the way. I've got them here, and I'll keep working on them as you submit them. But um, anyway, so once this is done, I can post the midterm itself. But I, I, you know, you can have at least a week to get it done, probably more than that so that in case you need to review or go through the videos or go through the slides again, you'll have plenty of time. There's no rush. Okay, let's put it that way. Even though the course only runs for roughly two more weeks, that should be plenty of time to get all of this done. All right, so we'll take care of that tomorrow. In fact, let me make sure, let me see if there's an announcement about in here. Uh, I wanna make sure that there's always an announcement. So there's no doubt in your mind about what we're doing. Oh, we'll go over it next week. Now, oh, one more thing too. This one, you're not, you do not need to hand it in. This one, we're just going to work on it together. The other ones, the chapter three, five, six, and seven problem sets, those you're supposed to hand in. But this one, this is just for practice. All right, so what I'm going to do is add a new announcement right now. And um, just to make it clear that we're, we want to do this starting tomorrow. So we will start going over the sample midterm on Tuesday, which 
And we also have to keep our eyes open on this. It is indeed January and it is 2022. The last time we met, it was still uh, December, of course. So we have to get used to this on Tuesday the 4th. And um, this does not need to be handed in. We will simply go over it <clears throat> together to make sure that everyone understands the material. Also, when we are done with it, I will post the solutions on Moodle, just in case you missed something. In other words, I've got them here. They're all tied up. They're really nice. They're ready to roll. Um, we'll go over them together and I'll put them up there and you can go through them again. And of course, as usual, you can always ask questions if you're not sure about something. And um, I think I've been keeping up with everyone's questions by email. I don't think I've neglected one of them. But if so, you can send me another email. Um, just say, listen, you know, um, it's possible to overlook because I get so, so, so many emails. But um, I'm trying very hard to uh, get to everybody's questions as soon as I see them. But if, if something happens and I don't notice or see your question or if it goes in my junk box, you can just feel free to write again and I'll get to you right away. All right, so that's that. And now today we can look at eight, which is not completely different than what we've just been doing. Um, most of these chapters and the early ones at least, they're all pretty different from each other. But going forward, um, what we're gonna discover is that we're gonna see the normal distribution quite a bit. Okay, we're never gonna stop using it. So uh, I'll open up the tables again. Um, we're gonna use it in a different way, but we are using the normal distribution in chapter eight. Okay, now in chapter nine, we're gonna introduce another very important probability distribution, which has a lot in common with the normal, but it has some important differences. And so that will come in nine, and that one, again, we'll keep using it uh, for the rest of the, course, because that has so many important properties. Okay, so let's get this going. Chapter eight. So um, let's see what this is all about. All right, hold on one second. Oh, sorry, that's not. Okay, today's the third. Oh, so I did it already, I typed in 21. Um, this used to be more of a problem in the in back in the day when people paid for a lot of things with checks, as opposed to credit cards or debit cards or whatever, or online transfers. Um, you know, the, for the month of January, everybody would keep writing the wrong date on their checks and it was a, kind of a headache. Now, hardly anyone uses checks, so it's less of a problem, but it's still a nuisance um, to get used to the new year, uh, especially the first couple of days after New Year. But luckily, our computers and our cell phones are there to remind us what the actual date is. All right, now, in this chapter, we're going to revisit the concept of sampling. <clears throat> now, we already know what a sample is. It's simply a subset of an underlying population. We randomly draw elements from that uh, population and uh, we're hoping that our sample accurately reflects the population. Now, it's, sampling is a much more complex process than it sounds. Um, we've been assuming that a sample was chosen and then we go ahead and do some calculations and that's fine. But it turns out there's a lot of different ways that we could potentially choose samples depending on what we're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> now, this part is actually um, a little bit different for every discipline. In other words, um, in psychology, the samples might be chosen in a very different way than they might be chosen in, let's say, economics or biology for that matter, or any of the other social sciences. Because with psychology, it's actually possible to conduct experiments or studies. And so the data has to be gathered in somewhat of a different way than with economics, where we don't normally conduct experiments. Instead, we basically just draw data from the real world and we try to draw conclusions from it. So in other words, it's not really practical or realistic to conduct experiments in economics. The data that we get 
is typically already out there in the real world. It's just a question of gathering it accurately. Whereas with um, experimental sciences like psychology, the data, the way the data is generated is an important part of the experiment. And so there's many, many different ways of doing it. Now here we'll focus all of our attention on a very basic approach, which works well for uh, finance and economics. And that would be the so-called simple random sample. So basically how this works is that whatever the population is, we're gonna choose our sample in such a way <clears throat> that every element of that population is equally likely to be chosen. All right, so that's, now like here's, here's an example of what I mean. Um, imagine you've got, um, let's say there's six, I think 16 people in this class. If I assigned everybody a random a number from one to 16, and I wanted to draw a sample of, let's say five of you, uh, what I would do is use a random number generator to pick five numbers from 16. And that's how I would generate my sample. So everybody would get a number, five of those numbers would be randomly chosen. Everyone has a one out of 16 chance of being chosen for the sample. And that's it. It's, that's as complicated as it gets. And that's perfect for what we want to do in finance and economics. Um, again, if we're doing something different, um, like for example, let's say this is a psychology study where it matters a great deal if the people we choose are men or women. Well, then we may want to make sure that our sample contains a certain <clears throat> minimum number of men and women. And that would be very different than what we're doing here where anything could happen. I can literally have all men, all women, some of each, because it doesn't really matter. That's irrelevant in, in what we're doing here, but in psychology, um, it may make a great deal of difference to the results. So here we're gonna focus all of our attention on simple random samples because they're very straightforward. They have uh, convenient properties and they're very useful when no experiments are being uh, conducted. Instead, we're just trying to draw conclusions about the underlying population. Now we're gonna introduce a couple of new key concepts here. Now, these are actually not new. What's new is the names that we're associating with these concepts. It turns out that in um, statistics, there are two types of summary measures that we could actually calculate. The first type is called a parameter. And now this one you're very familiar with because you've seen these before. Um, what this is all about, Oh, hold on. As usual, my tablet is not plugged in. I have to do something first. Hold on one second. Hmm seems to be very stubborn with me here. Well, that's very bizarre. Okay, I guess it's time. All right, hold on one second. All right, we should be good now. All right, so what I was starting to say is that um, the measures we saw in chapter three that represent a population, mu, sigma squared, sigma, and the population proportion as well, pi. These are all summary measures of a population. In statistics, they're formally known as parameters. Okay, so um, you may not have heard that terminology before. They're known as parameters. And we sometimes use this to describe the properties of a probability distribution. Uh, for example, you know that the Poisson distribution is characterized by lambda. Uh, that type of thing. Those are also defined as parameters, but the word statistic refers to the summary measures that are used to describe 
um, a sample. Okay, so in other words, a statistic is a summary measure of a sample. So in other words, that would include things like X bar, S squared, S and P, this, uh, which is the sample proportion. Uh, just in case you've forgotten, and then pi, remember, we've been using that as the population proportion. Okay. So, of course, if the samples, right, oh, and also, by the way, we could also then make the case that these statistics that we're calculating here from sample data are used to come up with an estimate of the corresponding population parameters. In other words, X neat bar is an estimate. Of mu. Okay, S squared is an estimate of S uh, sigma squared, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so why do we bother with the uh, statistics? Why don't we just use parameters? Well, because most of the time the population is too large for us to realistically gather up every element in the population. So we typically wind up leaning on samples instead. Okay, now. Imagine the following scenario. Uh, let's just say that you want to conduct a study. Let's say a marketing research firm wants to determine the um, average age of the customers in a particular city. Okay. In other words, they want to know if, let's say that they're trying to sell a product in a, in a city where they need to know if the average age is unusually high or unusually low. Let's say you live in a city where there's a lot of college students, so the average age is relatively low, or maybe there's another city where there's a lot of retired people, so the average age is fairly high. So, um, in order to um, research this question, the firm visits the local mall and surveys people about various questions, including their ages. All right, so imagine, you know, you've done, you've seen this. They're standing around there with clipboards and they're asking you questions about this. Have you seen this commercial on TV? Um, how much do you spend in the mall every, you know, things like that. They want to know about you because you're the customer and it helps them to understand better their target audience for when they market a product. So um, now here's the interesting part. We're going to visualize two situations. Suppose that one day the firm chooses random samples of five people and computes the mean or average age of the people in each sample. Okay, so they take five people at a time and they average out their ages. So you, for each sample, you have a single mean Right, so each sample has a mean. And we could, I guess we could write that as X bar with a little I next to it to indicate that is the mean of sample I. Now, the next day, the same firm comes back to the mall and says, all right, we're going to try a different approach today. This time they pick a hundred people at a time.
Okay, so it's the same setup, except today we're doing 100 at a time. Now, here's the question. On average, if the samples are chosen well, or to represent the population, the sample means should reflect the actual mean of the population. Okay, in other words, if, uh, for example, if the actual population mean age is 29, the samples, the sample means should be close to 29. And on average, all of the sample means should average out to 29. Okay, so let me just show you numerically what I'm talking about here. Um, now remember, in the first case, we have bots. All right, so for the group, All right, and so we get 27. Uh, let's try, no, let's try a different one. 16, 27, uh, 35. Hold on. Thirty-two and thirty-five again. Okay. Now it turns out the average of these sample means is twenty-nine, just as we hoped. All right. So we can think of this as uh, let's call this x bar one, x bar two x bar three, x bar four, and x bar five. Now for the other, the second day though, the results could be a little different. Imagine instead on the second day, we have something like this. Okay, so instead we have, oh, let's say 26, 27, 29, 31, and uh, let's see. Thirty-two. Okay, so the average of these sample means is twenty-nine, but there is a big difference between the two samples. So let me just uh, put them together on the same slide so you can see them. So for sample size five, we had. Uh, these sample size a hundred. We have these. So what's different about them? The key difference is that the sample means for size 100 are much closer to each other than the sample means for size 5. So in other words, if you look at these numbers, the range is only 6. For here, the range is, only, is 19, which is what you'd expect because with a sample size of five, you can have a group of people whose ages are very different from each other. Whereas if you have a sample of 100, there could be some very young people in there and some very old people. But 
on average, their ages should more or less average each other out. In other words, if you have a large enough group and you do have a few older people in there, there'll probably also be some younger people in there to balance out those ages. So with a small sample, you're gonna get a much larger um, difference between the sample means. Whereas with the large samples, you're gonna get a much smaller difference between the sample means. They're gonna be much, much closer to each other. But if you notice on average, they're both equal to the population mean. The average shouldn't be too far away, but what's different is the changes from one sample mean to the next. So what is this all about? The sample means themselves, because they're different, every time we draw a new sample, we can think of the sample mean as a random variable. Because what, what are we doing here? We're conducting an experiment. The experiment consists of choosing a sample. And that sample will have a different mean for most likely for every sample. So in other words, it's, it's no different than conducting an experiment in any other area. It's an experiment where we just choose samples, we record the means, and so, if we think of the sample mean in this case as a random variable, then it has its own unique probability distribution. So in other words, X bar can be thought of, although it's a constant for a single sample, as we keep repeating this process of sampling and you create a series of X bars, the X bars can be thought of as a random variable with its own unique probability distribution. And that being the case, I can ask questions like this. Uh, what's the probability that the mean that I observed with the sample is at least 45, let's say, or less than 19. I can actually calculate probabilities for my sample means given this probability distribution. Now, that's what this is all about. Now, by the way, when we are using a sample statistic like this and generating a probability distribution, it has its own special name. Now, remember, we've said this before, in statistics, there's often multiple names that have similar meanings. And this is no exception. In the specific case where we're generating a probability distribution from samples like this, the resulting distribution is called a sampling distribution. Okay, that's what this is all about. It's called now, it's still a probability distribution, but it's a special type of probability distribution that has its own unique set of properties. Luckily for us, though, as long as we're focusing our attention on the sample mean X bar, it turns out that this sampling distribution is normal. Okay, it's completely normal. In other words, we can continue to use the normal distribution. Okay, um, sorry, I, I, I'm doing some little thing on the side here. Um, hold on one second. I'm trying to get my um, drives all lined up properly. All right, we're good. Okay, so it turns out, but um, so anyway, I have some more examples here. Uh, we don't actually we don't need this one. This is similar to what I just did. Uh, imagine again here I generated this uh, on my uh, in a copy of Excel. Um, same thing. We got five people in each sample, and you notice the means are quite a bit different from each other because it's such a small sample. And that's what I was getting at before. And, and again, this is imagine the marketing research firm is in the mall. These are the ages of the individuals, by the way. And you notice. They, the smallest, there's a baby here who's one, and there's a four-year-old, but then there's also somebody who's 97. They're still shopping. Good for them. Um, you never get tired of shopping. 
But anyway, um, so those are the actual ages. Now, this is sample one and the mean is 35.2. This is sample two is 55 and all the way up. This one down here is 19. So that's with a sample of five. And here, what I did was I actually turned those results into a histogram. You can see the numbers are scattered all over the place. Okay, you've got groups with very low means, you've got very high means, and you have everything in between. So this is the distribution when the sample size is five. Now, that doesn't follow any particular probability distribution because this, the means are so small. I mean, sorry, the samples are so small. It's hard to fit this into a different, a given probability distribution. But if we go up to 20, this is, in this case, I use the case of 20. Now, well, look what happens. The actual data is not listed here separately, but the histogram is. Now look at this histogram compared to this one. Here the sample size is five and here it's 20. And if you look at it carefully, the range is much smaller. Not only that, but it's starting to kind of look like a normal distribution. It's still, it's a little off, but it, I mean, it's still getting there. So we're going to find out in a few minutes that there's a very formal result in statistics, which shows us that if our sample size is 30 or more, then we can use the normal distribution to describe these, um, these sample means. Okay, so the cutoff point is 30. Under 30, it's hard to say what we have. But according to this very important result in statistics, the central limit theorem, there's two conditions under which we can treat X bar as a normal random variable. Okay, normal random variable. Number one, if the population itself is normal, then of course the means themselves also have to be normal. So there's nothing to worry about there. In that case, the sample size is irrelevant. If I'm choosing elements from a normal population, the means have to be normal. But if the population either is not normal or if it is not known to be normal, in other words, we don't necessarily know what the population is. If we know for a fact that it's not normal or if we're not sure, we don't have to worry about it because as long as the sample size is at least 30, then we can treat X bar as being normal. So really the only time you can't treat X bar as normal is if we first don't know if the population is normal or if it's definitely not normal and it is, uh, the sample size is very small, meaning less than 30. Now, in this chapter, we're only going to do cases where X bar is normal. We will not consider the cases where we have a non-normal population with small samples. That would require a more advanced chapter, which we do not have time to do. Okay, so under these conditions, we can treat X bar just like any other normal random variable, and we can use the tables, or we can do whatever we need to do. Now, I'd also like to point out here though, that, and we'll see this later on in the chapter. Um, yes, so either if the samples are drawn from a normal population or the sample sizes are large, then we can use the normal distribution. Now, by the way, this is only true for X bar. So let me add that to the top here, just to make it crystal clear. For the other sample statistics, these rules could be different. So for X bar though, that's all we need to treat it as a normal random variable. What about the others though? What about S squared, for example, or P? 
We're not going to do those here. Well, actually, one of them we are. But um, I, I'd like to add that in here now as a new uh, slide here. The sample proportion is normal P is normally distributed uh, regardless of the underlying population and the sample size. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that, but uh, there are some restrictions on this. Um, based on the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. And we did this in chapter uh, five, the, no, six, sorry, chapter six is the last thing we did. The normal approximation of the binomial gives us the justification for treating the sample proportion as being normal. And here's why. Remember what a proportion is. Let's say I'm trying to find out what proportion of the US population is retired. Everybody in the population is either retired or they are not, or at least let's just treat it that way. I mean, yeah, yeah you get some people who are retired and they still work part-time, whatever. But let's just say you're either retired or you're not. It's a very, that means that being retired is a binomial random variable. And so the proportion represents how many of the elements of the sample have this characteristic out of the total. So it means that when we're dealing with a sample proportion, we're effectively using the binomial distribution, but we've already seen that under cer certain conditions, we can replace the binomial distribution with the normal distribution. Okay, so that's what we'll be doing here. So while the sample proportion technically follows the binomial distribution, we already have seen that we can use the normal approximation of the binomial in its place. Now, having said that, there are some bizarre cases where the sample proportion will not really be normal, but for most cases, it's close enough that we will always use the normal distribution when we're dealing with the sample proportion, okay? So that's that also is something we'll be doing in this chapter. Now, what about the other two sample statistics that we know? All right, the sample variance S squared Oops, I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of the awkward things about PowerPoint. Superscripts are a bit of a nuisance. It's much easier in Word. And sample standard deviation um, do not follow the normal distribution under any circumstances. These require different distributions. Okay, now those distributions we will not be covering in this class. So you will not run into this again unless you take a more advanced statistics course. Now, some schools, uh, the business school requires two semesters in statistics and some only require one. So if you're going to a school that requires a second semester of statistics, this, this, of course, is the first semester, what we're doing right now. Then you might run into this in your second semester. But if not, well, you know what? Um, if you're really dying to know about it, you can, you can read the book. It's in there in the later chapters. But you can create sampling distributions for the variance and standard deviation, but <coughs> they follow a very different distribution, which we have not encountered yet, and we will not have time for it in this class. But if you do take another semester of stats, most likely you'll run into it then. All right, so for us, for this chapter, we'll just need the normal distribution because we're only going to focus on the sample mean and the sample proportion. 
All right. Now. Yes. Oh, and by the way, if you're if you're going to take uh, any stats classes in the math department, oh, you'll cover everything because they really take the stuff and run with it. Because in the math department, they're trying to explain to you how these results were derived, and you know their their motivation is a little different here in, uh, in most business schools. We're just trying to get results now. You know, the, it, every school. Oh, organizes their statistics a little differently. Here, we only have it in the math department, but that's because it, it applies to uh, the economics department as well. But, you know, if you're going to a school that offered a math major, which we don't have, um, the stats courses there would be very, very complicated. Here, it's just meant to be the first semester, which is perfect for almost any discipline you might be pursuing, like business or psychology or biology, whatever the case may be. So this is the basics. But if you need something more specialized, um, you'll have to probably take it in that department at your own school. On the other hand, if this is all you want for, from stats, that's fine too. Because if you go on to MBA school, for example, um, it, you might get a little more advanced than this, but not very much. Um, we're doing the important stuff here, that's for sure. So in other words, if you don't take any more stats, well, it's not the worst thing in the world, but if you're curious, if you really want to pursue this further, it's probably available as long as, you know, depending on where you're going. All right, anyway. Now, it turns out though, even though we're using the normal distribution, we have to make some changes. Now, remember the concept of moments. There are three basic moments um, or types of moments that we were looking at in a previous chapter and they were expected value, the variance, and the standard deviation. Okay, just a quick reminder. We did this in chapter six and five, actually, for that matter. Moments refer to probability distributions. And for X bar, the moments are a little bit different than what we were used to. Okay, so once you understand what those moments are, we can take any um, sample mean, we can convert it into a standard normal random variable, and then we can use our tables to calculate probabilities. But we have to learn the formulas for these moments. So again, remember, always going on behind the scenes in this chapter, there's some underlying population which has its own properties. And what we're doing is drawing samples from that population. So um, let's just quickly remind ourselves that in this chapter, we are drawing samples from a population using simple random samples, that is. And we assume that the population has a mean, which we designate with the Greek letter mu. Remember um, from an earlier chapter, mu is the Greek letter that represents mean. And a standard deviation, uh, sigma. Okay, so assuming that those are the numbers uh, that apply to the population, we don't actually know what they are, but we know that the samples themselves should give us a great deal of information about these numbers. So with our sampling, what we have to do here, oh, by the way, I drew this little picture. I'm hoping that this helps us understand the distinction between the population and the sampling distribution. Um, I, uh, what I did here was on the top, on the left, we have any population. That's this monstrosity here on the left. And these are all the X's. These are the elements of the population. From that, we draw a bunch of samples and create sample means on the right. All these X bars are means of samples that are at least of size 30. 
And you can see the difference between the two. The one on the left is clearly not normal. The one on the right is clearly normal. Okay. And then in the bottom, if the population is already normal, then the X bars will be normal regardless of the sample size. Okay. So that's what this picture is trying to show us. On the top, as long as our samples are large enough, the population doesn't matter. The X bars will still be normal. But if the population is normal, then the sampling, uh, the X bars will be normal regardless of the sample size. So I don't know if that helped or not, but I thought I'd give it a shot. All right, so here they are. Now, once again, I, I mentioned this all the time, there are often multiple names that refer to similar or identical concepts in statistics. Now, we're looking at the, the moments of the sampling distribution of X bar, here specifically of X bar. We have the expected value or mean, we have the variance. Now here's where it gets strange. The standard deviation, when we're dealing with sample statistics only, this is often referred to as the standard error. Now, why do they have to do this to us? Well, I think the motivation was to make sure that when you say the word standard error, it's understood that you're talking about a distribution for X bar or some other sample statistic, as opposed to the standard deviation of the underlying population. So just remember, the words standard error in this chapter means the same thing as standard deviation. It's a subtle distinction, but just be aware that you may see these words tossed about. Just remember, it's the same thing as the standard deviation, only it applies to X bar. So think of this as the standard error. Is the standard deviation of X bar, all right? Just be aware of that. All right, now if you, you know, you can usually, if you say the word standard deviation here, it's not wrong, it's just that it's more maybe consistent to call it a standard error. All right, now what I'm about to show you is the formulas for calculating these. Now remember, every time we've encountered moments, we've had a special set of formulas. And this is no exception. What's different now is that they are taken directly from the properties of the underlying population. And also, for the first time, this is something new. Uh, let me sneak this in here. With a sampling distribution, we need to take into account both the sample size and the population size. Okay, so in other words, I did mention somewhere along the way that we eventually will have formulas that require both of these. And here, here it is for the first time. So remember, we early on defined capital N to be the population size. Lowercase n is the sample size. Why do we need to make two different kinds of Ns? because in this chapter, both of these will show up in the same formulas. Um, now, here's another thing we have to get ready for. <laughs> like we need more strange concepts. <laughs> All right, let me sneak this in here. According to the central limit theorem, the sample size, a sample, let's, okay, a sample size of at least 30 ensures that the sampling distribution of X bar is normal. Therefore, a sample of at least 30 is known as a large sample 
a sample of less than third is known as a small sample. All right, that's fine, but now <laughs> we've got another definition that sounds like it's the same thing, but it's not. Okay, oh, let me leave that there for a minute. Um, so we're gonna th think of the word small and large as being relative to 30 when it comes to the central limit theorem. But as far as the moments are concerned, the terms small and large, Um, are defined relative to the size of the population. In other words, think of these as relative measures. Up here, these are absolute terms. 30 is the cutoff point, large and small, for deciding if our um, X bar is normal. But as far as the moments are concerned, we have to make a distinction between large and small again, but now we're thinking in terms of the comparison between the size of the sample and the size of the population. So just to summarize it, if a sample represents more than 5% of the underlying population, it is said to be large relative to the population. If, well, clearly that means if a sample represents 5% or less of the underlying population, it is said to be small relative to the population. Ah, uh, just what we needed. So there's really two different ways of thinking about small and large. We have an absolute measure, which means we compare it to 30, where we don't, by the way, in this case, we don't care what the population size is. It's, we're only focused on the sample size. But here, what we're trying to do is capture the relationship between the size of the sample and the overall population. And here, 5% is the cutoff point between large and small. Oh my God. Now, when we're done with this, it sounds very complex and confusing and abstract and all the rest, but believe me, after you've done one or two of these examples, this will all seem fine. It's, it seems like a lot now, but it really isn't. Once you've done a few of these, you'll have no problems with it at all. So let me just show, throw a quick example in there. Um, numerical examples, you can really see what this is all about. Suppose that our population size is a thousand. Any sample greater size greater than 50 is considered to be large relative to the population, any sample size, actually, I'm sorry, this is, should be greater than or equal to, no, no, I, I'm sorry, it's right, yes, this is fine. Um, any sample size of 50 or less is considered to be small relative to the population. Okay, now we're good. So there's 50 in this case would be the cutoff point between large and small because that's 5% of the entire population. For different population size, clearly the numbers will be different. So you can see with the central limit theorem, 30 is the absolute measure of small and large, but here it depends on the size of the population. Okay, and it will be different in every case. Now, why does this matter? Um, 
because the key to the whole thing here is that as sample sizes increase, the um, uncertainty, let's say, uh, let's say the variation from one sample mean to the next decreases. Therefore, standard deviation or standard error of a large sample will be smaller than for um, a small sample. Now, this is getting back to the idea um, the standard deviation or standard error is smaller for a sample of 100 than for a sample of five, as we saw already. And this is how we capture that. Okay, so again, what matters is that 5% is the magic number. All right, now, with all that being said, we can finally introduce these moments. All right, here we go. Now, we need to introduce some new notation here. We already know that the population mean is mu, the population variance is sigma squared, and the population standard deviation is sigma. Okay, so now here, we're doing something a little different. Okay, so remember, population mean is mu, um, mean of x bar, or I should say mean of the sampling distribution is written as mu with a little subscript x bar. so that we can tell them apart, okay? So in other words, the mu by itself is the population mean. Mu with a little x bar next to it is the average of all of our sample means. So now, no matter how many samples we've taken, when we average them out, we end up with this number mu x bar, which is the average of all of our x bars. Now, we're gonna do the same thing with the variance and standard deviation. We're going to put that little x bar there to separate it from the population version. Okay, so that way we always know which is which. The one without an x bar script uh, subscript is the population version. The one with the x bar refers to the sampling distribution of x bar. Okay. All right, let me uh, quickly summarize this on another chart so you can really see it. So here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, moments. Population. And then here we have the sampling distribution. Of X bar. And so we have mu new x bar. So it's really just that simple. We're just adding that little x bar there so we can tell them apart. Now, the next thing we have to do though, is see what the formulas are for calculating these measures on the right. These we need a formula to calculate. And they'll be based on the population, but they could be different. Well, the first one is easy. It couldn't be any easier. Okay. Um, the mean of X bar 
is equal to the mean of the population. All right, let me write that down here separately. Okay, so the mean, as we saw, remember with the example of the ages, the sample means were all different, but they averaged out to the same as the population. The mean of all X bars equals the population mean. Now, you notice this is assuming that we've chosen our samples correctly. I mean, if we did a bad job choosing our samples, this may not be the case, but in general, this is what happens. All right, it's the next two that are a bit of trickier. All right, the next two, although you know that the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, here's what's gonna happen. The values of uh, sigma squared x bar and sigma x bar depend on the sample size and population size. Okay, so on the left, we're gonna have a small sample. Now remember, that means that the sample size is less than or equal to 5% of the population size. In other words, this is shorthand for saying less than or equal to 5% of the population. Whereas over here, we'll have the large sample. Okay. So here we have What does that mean? In other words, if you have a small sample, what you're doing is you're taking the population variance and you're simply dividing it by the sample size. And then down here, this is just the um, square root. Okay, it's usually written like this, sigma over radical n. If we have a large sample, it gets a little messier. <clears throat> Getting a little low on space here. Um, So we have that extra term. If you notice on the right, we've got both capital N, the population size, and lowercase n, the sample size. So basically, when you're doing these calculations, you have to make a decision before you start anything you have to make a decision as to whether or not this is a large or a small sample. And if you, depending on which one it is, that will affect our determination of the variance and the standard deviation. Once we know those, we can then start calculating probabilities, but these have to be determined first. The population mean is easy. The mean is easy. It's the same as the population mean. This is the tricky part. 
So you have to compare the sample with the population and decide is it small or is it large? Once you decide, then you can plug in the numbers you have and you have your appropriate variance and standard deviation for X bar. With that in place, we can then, as we'll see in a minute, calculate normal probabilities. So again, all of this background seems very complicated, but once we've done a few of these, you'll see that it's really not that harder than what we did in the last chapter. Okay. By the way, there more terminology, like we need more terminology. For the standard deviation or standard error, this term in the square root has a special name. Um, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but it's often referred to as the finite population correction factor. And it simply is designed to correct for the fact that a large sample or large samples, I guess, reduces the standard deviation. Because the way this number is defined, it's guaranteed to be less than one um, as long as n is greater than one. So there's, if your sample size is at least two, this term will be less than one. So basically it's shrinking up the standard deviation to reflect the fact that this is a pretty large sample. All right, so finally, we're actually gonna get some problem. Now here's the big, this is like the payoff to all this. Recall that when we wanted to calculate normal probabilities, we use the standard normal table. And so if our probabilities were not already standard normal, we had to use a conversion factor. And we're gonna do something very much like that right now. So let me sneak in another slide here. And basically what I'm gonna do is show you uh, a comparison between what we did in the last chapter and what we're about to do. So um, here we go. So recall, let's let's say recall something from chapter seven. Um, when calculating normal probabilities, um, the conversion formula is used to convert a normal random variable X into a standard normal random variable Z. This is done so that the tables can be used normal probabilities. That was the motivation for doing this. Well, here we're gonna have something similar and the magic word there is similar. You'll, you'll recognize right away how similar it is, but it has an important difference. So let's look at it. When we calculate, wait a minute. You know, this really, um, it's giving me trouble about, of course it is, saving it.
unbelief. I tell you, this computer has got to go. Unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Just making sure that it isn't losing my work. All right, so I had to give it a new name because it's it's just acting up. It just doesn't feel like working properly today. It's it's a like I said, PC stands for piece of crap. Never forget that. All right, anyway. So here we go. This is what it looks like now. So you can see how similar it is. It used to be X minus mu over sigma. The only thing we changed was that now all of a sudden everything is in terms of X bar. Okay. So um, that's the main. Oh, what's the, oh, we can get this. That's what's going on here. All right. So that's the difference. But of course, we have formulas for calculating these two expressions. And of course, you notice how we're comparing x bar with these other terms instead of x. Once this is done, this is no different than any other normal calculation or normal probability calculation you've ever seen. Okay. Well, um, now given that it's quarter after 11, I'll tell you what we'll do. Why don't we um, have our break right now? And then when we get back, we'll do some calculations here. We're gonna start some um, actual examples. Now, once we start doing the examples, you'll see it's pretty straightforward. I mean, when, like I said, once you've done a few, you'll realize pretty quickly it's really not that bad. It seems like up to this point, it's been very abstract and complicated, but really what it boils down to is calculating mu x bar and sigma x bar, and then calculating normal probabilities. And that's really all we have to do. Okay. It's not nearly as complicated as it sounds. Ultimately, our aim is to calculate probabilities for X bar at, instead of the underlying population. So, all right, we'll stop here for a bit. And when we get back, we'll uh, start this first example. We have a hedge fund with 10,000 stocks. We know that the mean is 10% and the standard deviation is 20. And what we're going to do is choose a sample of stocks and calculate probabilities that the stocks have uh, certain rates of return, okay? So, all right, I'll see you all in about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll get going again with this.
All right. Okay. So I think we're ready for our examples. <clears throat> so once again, we have a hedge fund that holds a portfolio with 10,000 stocks in it. The average annual rate of return is 10%. Now that's mu right there. And that's because this, um, the returns to these stocks is our population. So the population in this example equals the returns to the 10,000 stocks. That's our um, population. So let's say this is a hedge fund. Um, you know, the, the portfolio manager is managing 10,000 stocks. And so right now the mean is 10% and the standard deviation is 20. And what we're gonna do is choose a sample and what we're basically going to do here now, by the way, the sample size is 100. I, oh, I, I almost forgot to mention um, the capital N would therefore be 10,000 because that's the uh, population size. We only want a sample of 100 stocks. So imagine we're trying to figure out if the sample that we've chosen has the following rates of return. Now, uh, if you notice, we're going to assume normality here. It doesn't explicitly say that the underlying population is normal, but since the sample size is at least 30, we can use the normal distribution according to the central limit theorem. Okay, so now, by the way, I did mention, we're not going to have any examples in this chapter where you cannot use the normal distribution because that requires other techniques that we will not be covering in this chapter, uh, in this uh, course. But just be aware that in principle, you must be able to show in order to use the normal distribution that you have at least 30 in your sample or else the underlying population is normal. Okay, so here we don't have to worry about that. So we've got three calculations to do. We want to know the probability that the mean of the sample, which is X bar, is at least 8%, which, by the way, once again, as we've seen before, I'm going to convert these percentages into decimals. I just find that it's easier that way. So for part B, we're trying to figure out the probability that the sample mean in these 100 stocks is less than or equal to 12%. And then finally, we want to know the probability that the mean is between 7 and 13%. The first thing we're going to do is calculate the moments of this sampling distribution. So first things first. Um, oh, actually, before we even do that, why don't we determine if the sample size is large or small relative to the population? So if you take the ratio of 100 to 10,000, that's 0.01 or 1%. And remember, the threshold is 5%. So because the sample size is only 1%, of the population size. It is considered to be small. And that will affect the moments, not this mean, of course, but the variance in the standard deviation. So we find out first, right up front, do we have a large or small sample? All right, so that means if you recall that finite population correction factor, we will not need it. We'll get to use the simpler formula for a standard error. So look how easy this is. The mean of X bar equals the population mean of 10%. The standard error or standard deviation of X bar is simply population standard deviation over square root of sample size, which is 0.02, and that's it. So when we go to calculate this measure, when we convert uh, these X bars into standard normal random variables, all we have to do is take X bar, whatever it is, subtract 10% uh, and divide by 2% and we have ourselves 
a standard normal random variable. And then we can use the tables. Not so bad. All right, so that's what we're aiming for. Okay, and we know how to do this. We've already done it before. So in the first case, we were looking for the probability that X bar was greater than or equal to 8%. So once again, remember in each of these cases, we're gonna subtract the mean of 10 and divide by the standard deviation of two. Now here, if you notice when we do that, we end up with the probability that Z is greater than or equal to negative one. Of course, that's not on our table, is it? No. What we have to do is flip this around and rewrite it as one minus the probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 1.0. Now this we can look up, let me go get the tables and we can confirm this, negative 1.0, Oh, sorry, we need the negative table. That's number two. Negative 1.0 is found right here. Negative 1.0 combined with 0 0.00 is, here we go, 1587. Okay, great. So we bring that back onto the slides. So what this means is that the shaded region is 0.1587, I'm sorry, the unshaded region, which is what we um, found on our table is 0.1587. The shaded region, which is what we really want, is 0.8413. Okay, so that's the final answer, 8413. Very good. So you can see it's really not much different than what we were doing before. Now, how about part B? This time it's a less than or equal to probability. So that'll make it a little bit faster. And by the way, if you're using one of the Texas Instruments calculators, I put the instructions in here for using it this just means that you don't have to use the tables, but those are the commands that you would use. If that's the calculator you're using, you can feel free to do it this way. But whether you are or not, you can always use the tables. All right, now, what about part B? <clears throat> Less than or equal to 12%. So once again, we're subtracting 10% or dividing by 2%. Oh, there you go. How easy is that? Anything below that. And that's on our table. You don't have to make any conversions or any uh, make any changes. If we go to the table and look for 1.00, um, the positive version of this table that is, Oh, what happened? Did I accidentally turn that one off, of course. Hold on one second. There we go, 1.0 combined with, good, 0. 0.00, and we're done. That's it, nothing else needs to be done. That's kind of nice. And by the way, if you noticed, um, it's the same number, isn't it? And here's why. Let me just quickly uh, draw a sketch of this thing. Remember, the mean is 10. Which is the mean. And then on either side of it,
we have the mean uh, plus one standard deviation, and down here we have 0 0.08. So in the first case, we're looking for everything above 8%. So let, let's do that in red, I guess. And then for the second one, we look for everything below 12. I guess we can call that green. So they're the same because in one case, we're looking at everything from one standard deviation below the mean and up. In the second case, you're looking at one standard deviation above the mean and, and below. So there, because of the symmetry of the distribution, the green and the red areas are identical to each other. That's why it's not a coincidence that they're both, uh, they both have a probability of 0.8413. Now the third one, we don't have any of that. Um, there's no symmetry involved here, but what we do have to do, as you recall, because we're looking at the probability of being between two different values, we're gonna to have to subtract one from the other. So after you subtract 10% and divide by two, what ends up happening is that you're actually, this is the equivalent of asking what's the probability that Z is between negative and positive 1.5 and this has to be broken up so you can calculate these two probabilities. Uh, below 1.5 and below negative 1.5. So if you look in the positive table for 1.50, uh, you will get, oops, uh, let's see. There we go. 1.5 combined with 0 0.00 is 0.9332. And we saw that on the slide right there. And then for negative 1.5, we go to the negative table and there it is, 0 0.0668. And that's this one. And when you subtract the two from each other, your final result here is 0.8664. So, you actually wind up with the area in between. All right, so that's that. Now, again, you see how this wasn't very different than what we did before. The only real difference is the way we convert to standard normal form, specifically this. This is it right here. And we know it's easy to calculate mu x bar. It's just equal to the population mean. The only tricky part is that sigma x bar, the standard error. And that only has one of two possible values. So once you figure it out, the sample is large or small, you're all set. There really isn't anything else to do except calculate the normal probabilities the normal way. Well, that's pretty reassuring. All that background was pretty challenging, wasn't it? Yeah, it seemed like it, but now we're gonna do another one where this time we have a small population, only 120 paintings in this entire population mean is a million dollars and the standard deviation is 120,000. So what we'd like to do is take a sample of, in this case, 10 of those paintings and we're going to calculate some probabilities for their values, for their mean values that is. All right, so let's do that. 
Man, how'd you like that to be uh, your collection? 120 paintings worth an average of a million dollars each. Not bad. Uh, this is probably what Jeff Bezos has is in, his, in his summer cottage, but um, it's a lot of money. Okay. So remember, the mean is a million. Standard deviation was 120,000. And the population size was 120. The sample size is 10. Now, by the way, this ratio is approximately 0.167. Okay, 10 out of 120. Oh, whoops, sorry, my fault. No, it's 0.083 that's still considered to be large, because remember the threshold is 5%. So this is a large sample. Because this number is greater than five. And you can tell when you have such a small sample, I mean, realistically, I mean, such a small population, a sample of any reasonable size is likely to be large. Okay, so these are the three probabilities that we'd like to calculate. And the first thing we'll do is, of course, we've already determined that this is a large sample because the sample size is about 8.333% of the population size, which is more than five. And so here's what we're going to do. Now this part never changes. The mean of this of X bar is the same as the mean of the population. This is the new part. We didn't do this earlier. We didn't need to. This is our finite population correction factor. And remember too, um, it's capital N is 120, lowercase n is 10. And we also know that sigma is 120,000. And uh, that's all we need. Now, this is a very messy thing to calculate, as you can see. But that means our standard error is 36,484.14. Because it's a large sample. Okay. So now the rest of it is the same. Okay, remember we're using this formula. All right. So let's go through these one at a time. How about this one? The mean is, is greater than or equal to a million dollars. Now, if you notice it, what's interesting here is that when you convert this to a standard normal random variable, we're comparing Z to zero, which is in the center of the distribution. And therefore we really don't even need the table for this because we know that by definition, this is equal to a half. But if you do use the table, you can go look this up and you'll discover but the probability that Z is below zero is a half. So let's go look at the table and find that. Okay, hold on. Now it's right up at the top. It's the combination of zero, 0, 0.0 and zero, zero, zero. So the zero, zero is here and it's a half right there. All right, and then you plug that in and you're all set. All right, well, that was pretty straightforward. The next two are a little bit messier. How about less than or equal to $950,000? All right, so again, we subtract the mean of a million dollars divided by the standard error. And that works out to Z being less than or equal to negative 1.37.
And of course, we can look that up directly on the table. You don't have to do anything else. And since it's way down here in the left tail, it's going to be a very small number. So it's already been done for you, but let's take a look at the negative table. Uh, let's get some of these out of here. Negative 1.3 combined with 0.07 is 0.0853, just as we see in the slides. And that's our final answer. So that's a pretty low probability. It's not impossible, but it's very low. Okay, one more. We have an in-between probability now. And again, if you're using the Texas Instruments calculator, those are your instructions. Here we are. What, are the, what is the likelihood that it's somewhere between $975,000 and $1,025,000? All right, so as usual, we apply our formula. We're subtracting a million, dividing by that 36,484.14. And then we're, by doing so, we're converting this to a z-score or standard normal random variable. All right. Give a minute to catch on. All right, so here's what it looks like. So that means it's the same thing as Z being between plus and minus 0.69. Now, since that's an in-between probability, we'll have to subtract one from the other, as we've done so many times. So we rewrite this as the probability that Z is less than or equal to 0.69 minus the probability that it's less than or equal to minus 0.69. And of course, we can look those both directly up in the tables. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's go confirm that 0.69 is this number. Uh, let's see where, 0 0.69. What you're doing is the 0.69 is rewritten as 0.6 plus 0.09. Here's the 0.6, here's the 0 0.09, 0 0.7549. Okay, now what about the negative one? Let's go over to that table. Oh, it's just barely visible on the bottom. Negative 0 0.6, 0 0.09, 0.2451. So when you subtract one from the other, the final result is 0.5098. Very good. Okay, so basically, so we covered both cases that you might run into, the large sample case and the small sample case, but you can see there, this is pretty much as complicated as it's going to get. So what is left to do in this chapter? Well, I mentioned earlier that you can actually calculate a sampling distribution for any sample statistic you want. You can do it for X bar, you can do it for S squared, for S, or for P, the sample proportion. So 
we're going to wrap up this chapter by introducing the sampling distribution of P, the sample proportion. Now, I did mention earlier that we can use the normal distribution here because the sample proportion really follows the binomial distribution, but we've already seen that we can use the normal approximation to come up with values for the binomial distribution. And that's exactly what we'll be doing here. Now, of course, proportions are different than means. This is the, um, you know, what we're essentially looking for is how many elements of a sample have a particular um, characteristic relative to the entire sample or population. So, you know, we often see this with the, like, political polling, those are all sample proportions that you're looking at. When they tell you that 48% of the population uh, is in favor of this candidate, that's a proportion that they're estimating for you. They're, they're giving you a sample proportion based on their sampling, but it's meant to represent the entire population. So how will this be different? Well, first of all, remember what the sample proportion is. Like I said, X is the number of elements with a particular characteristic, or in terms of the binomial distribution, X is actually the number of successes. You can think of them as successes. So in other words, if you're thinking about a political poll, this would be the number of people who favor the candidate. And N is, the, of course, the sample size. So this is how the sample proportion is defined. Okay, X out of N. Now, of course, the underlying population proportion, I just want to remind you in this book, which we mean the proportion of all voters who prefer this candidate is written as capital pi. So P is an estimate of pi. Okay, just remember that as we go along, Pi is the population proportion, P is the sample proportion or estimate of the population proportion. Okay, uh, let's see. Now, this if you wanna be super technical about it, we use this in the previous chapter to talk about when it is appropriate to use the normal approximation to the binomial. If both of these conditions are true, um, the sample size times the uh, pi is greater than or equal to five, pi times one minus five is also greater than or equal to five. When these are both true, the normal approximation of the binomial is going to give us very good results. If not, the results won't be quite as good, but we, we can still use the normal distribution. It's just that the, the quality of the uh, approximation starts to break down if both of these conditions fail to hold. What you're essentially seeing here is that we're looking for a large number of trials and a relatively low probability of success to make the accuracy as high as possible. But assuming those conditions are met, here's what's going to happen. The sample proportion has its own moments. What are the moments Let me just write this in here. Moments of the sample proportion P. Well, the expected value. Now remember with the mean, um, let's just throw this over here. The expected value P is the population value pi. Just like with the uh, mean, the expected value or mean of X bar equals the population mean. That's why this happens. On average, the proportion in our samples should match up with the entire population. So that's the easy part. The tricky part, as you can probably guess, is coming up next, the variance and the standard error. All right, they will be a, a little bit different depending on the population size. All right, here we go. So this is the small sample.
And remember, less than or equal to 5% of the population means we have a small sample. And then the variance equals this expression, which of course means that the standard error would simply be the square root of this. All right, but on the other hand, what happens if there is a large sample? Well, then we need our old friend, the finite population correction factor. All right, so how would that look? Oh yeah, there we go. So it would be the same, except this piece is required to correct for the fact that this is a large sample. And that of course means that our standard error looks like this. Okay. All right. Now we're ready for a problem because that's all you need to know. And by the way, once again, remember we're assuming normality here because we're basically leaning on the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. All right, so here we go. Suppose that the US government data show that 15% of Americans are retired. We wanna know if the proportion of retirees in New York State, though, is 20% or more. We just, for some reason, they want to know if there tends to be more retired people in New York than the rest of the country. So they're going to choose a sample of 200 residents of New York, and they'll ask the following question. What's the probability that the actual proportion is 20% or more? Now, in a case like this, by the way, the population of New York State is enormous. It's like in the millions. So we can pretty much just assume right off the bat that we have a small sample. We don't even really need to know the exact size of the population because remember the cutoff point is 5%. And 5% in this case would mean that the population only has to be at least 4,000 for this to be considered a small sample. So I think we can safely bet that the population of New York State is more than 4,000. So we don't really have to worry about it too much. It's pretty clear that this is a small sample. So what about the moments? Well, the moment, the mean of this would have to be the population measure of 15%. Okay. And then, which means that on average, the proportion, sample proportion should equal the population proportion of 15%. What about the variance though? All right, now the variance here is defined. By the way, if you notice the variance for the um, sampling distribution of P is a little different than it was for the mean. Pi times one minus pi over N. In this case, um, we have, about 0 0.0064 is our variance, which implies that our standard deviation is the square root of that, which is still a very small number. It's a little larger than that, but it's not that big. So how much is that? If you take the square root of 0 0.0064, you'll get approximately 0 0.02525, about two and a half percent. All right, so as we've seen, this is the, oh, we haven't seen it yet. This is how we, now for this um, case, this is the conversion into a standard normal random variable. Ah, I see. Now, if you wanted to write it differently, this is just the expression.
That's what it is. We just filled in the variables. Now, in our case, this number is 0.15. And this entire denominator is 0.02525. We've already calculated that by plugging in the numbers. Well, now let's calculate the probability. It's only the one probability, by the way. We're looking for uh, the probability that the um, proportion exceeds 20%. All right, so this is what we're gonna do. We'll subtract, here's the P, here's the expected P, and here's the standard deviation of P. We subtract 15, percent divided by 0 0.02525, and this is what we end up with. Now, of course, because this is a greater than or equal to probability, when we go to the table, we have to rewrite it like this. But that's not hard. We know how to do that. So let's go to the normal table and confirm what this value is. 1.98. We're looking for the combination of 1.9 plus 0.08. And that will be Here's the 1.9, here's the 0.08, 9761. When you subtract that, um, this is, by, this is yeah, the part we don't want, 0 0.9761 is on the table. The shaded area, which is what we want, is one minus that or 0 0.0239. All right, that's our final answer. So it's not likely. Given that the average is 15% in the entire country, um, the likelihood of it being more than 20% in any given area is only about 2.39%. So it's not likely. It's not impossible, but it's not likely. All right. So that pretty much is it for sampling distributions. We only have the two, we have the mean and we have the standard, uh, sorry, the proportions. They're both going to follow the normal distribution. Now the next chapter nine, that will not be true. So, you know what, uh, I'll tell you what, let me just quickly show you a peek at nine. I'm not gonna get too deeply into it because it's very late. Just to give you a sense of where we're going. We're gonna create something which is called a confidence interval. So a confidence interval, just to get this ball rolling, is a range of values, which is assumed to contain the value of a population parameter, such as the mean. But here's the different part. We haven't seen this before. The notion of a level of confidence. Now, the thing is about statistics is every result we get is subject to uncertainty. Like if I go, I can sample all the people that I want and write down their ages, but unless I actually measure the entire population, I will never know for sure if my, popula my sample means do exactly match the population mean. There's always going to be some room for uncertainty there. It's possible, for example, that my samples were not as representative as they could have been, and my estimate is too high or too low compared to the actual population. So what we need to do is think in terms of probabilities, or in this case, levels of confidence, which means that I want to be able to calculate not only some measure like the sample mean, but I need to be able to attach to it a probability that it's actually correct because we know that there's always a chance that it's not. So with a confidence interval, I'm creating something a little different. 
it's not just a single value like a sample mean, but a range of values that has a specific probability attached to it. Now, let me show you a quick, simple example of this. Suppose that I've done some research and I've discovered that there's an, I have created a 95% confidence interval in the mean price of gas in the United States. And I come up with these results, $2.99 up to $3.39. So what I'm essentially saying here is that, uh, by the way, this is, we're gonna call this my lower limit. And this is my upper limit. What I'm saying is that, the mean, which by the way, is halfway between these two, which we'll see as we get into this chapter. So in other words, if you notice $3.19 is in the middle. So the lower limit, if you notice, is X bar minus 20 cents. And the, this one, the upper limit is X bar plus 20 cents. So that 20 cents represents our uncertainty about the sample mean. We, we, we're saying, listen, the average appears to be 319, but we're willing to allow for the possibility that it could be as little as 299 or as much as 339. Because we know that we didn't go to every single gas station in the country when we did this. So that 20 cents is often known as the margin of error. It's the, it basically represents how much uncertainty there is associated with this X bar. And that margin of error depends on a lot of things, including how confident do we need to be in the results. So what I'm really saying here is that there's a 95% chance that the actual population mean is somewhere between 299 and 339, although our best estimate is 319. Still, there's a chance that it's somewhere between 299 and 339, a very high chance that it's in that range somewhere. So this interval is actually giving us more information than just X bar by itself, because with X bar, we only know the best estimate. Now we have some sense of how much uncertainty there is associated with this, uh, this estimate. So this is an extremely important area of study. And um, we'll see when we get into the chapter that we can continue to use the normal distribution for some cases. But unfortunately, there will be other cases where we can't and for those, we need to introduce a brand new probability distribution, which won't take that long to learn it, but it is a little different. And so those two will be used in this chapter and in 10 to come up with our results. All right, so it's, it's getting very late here. I just wanna remind everyone that tomorrow we'll be going over the sample midterm and it's a very long one, as you saw. I, I don't know if it'll take up the entire class or not. If it does, we can finish it up on Wednesday. But when we're done with it, you'll be ready for the actual midterm. Okay, so we'll, we'll go over that again tomorrow. In the meantime, um, what you need to do is, of course, review what we did today. And um, I think I'd already set up a schedule for when the problem sets are due. Right now, you're only ready to do three, five, six, and seven. I think uh, we had a schedule here somewhere with the announcements. Um, five was supposed to be due today or tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow, okay. Six. Oh, uh, Wednesday, oh, Wednesday, that's fine. You shouldn't have any trouble getting it done by Wednesday. And then seven, I guess. We didn't say, but I guess seven can be due next Monday. Um, now I'm trying to avoid having them all due at the last minute, but uh, let's do that. Let's just, let's just say that the chapter seven, the chapter seven problem set,
will be due on Monday, January 11th. Okay, that sounds good. And then you know later on that week we'll we'll continue because this week, wow, next week is the last full week. Uh, our last official day is Monday the 17th. I guess by then everything has to be done, but. Um, and even then, if the class ends on the 17th, you can probably have a couple more days after that because the grades won't be due until probably that Thursday. So we, we shouldn't run out of time here, but we don't want to, you know, in the past, I didn't plan this as well as I might have. And all of a sudden, three or four of these were due within a few days of each other, which we don't want that either. So um, so the two things we need to remember here, we'll, we'll finish these up. Um, we'll worry about the chapter eight problem set later on since we just finished it, but tomorrow our focus needs to be on the sample midterm so that you'll be ready to roll in the actual midterm. And um, that way it can give you a minimum of a week to get it done. All right, so get that thing out and start working on it. Uh, I, now, one of the good things about having such a short semester is that even the content that we did in chapter three, it's only been a couple of weeks. So it's not likely you've already forgotten it, but you should go back and review it anyway you know, make sure that you really get it. And so um, that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. All right. So if there's no last minute questions, I guess we'll cut it off right here. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. All right. See you then. Thank you. All right. Bye.